you guys doing today? I want to welcome you guys, especially if you're a visitor with us. My name is Derek Atkinson. I'm the lead pastor, and we are just so glad that you're here to worship with us. If you would open your Bibles and open up the Word of God and get your, uh, get your notes ready, whether they're on your phone, on our app, or right in your hand, which is what you brought in today, um, thank you for doing that. And as you open them up, open them up to Luke chapter 23, if you would. And I just want to uh, encourage you guys, uh, next service we'll have some friends of ours who are... Um, uh, taking to the road. I, I, we want to seek to bless them. The Campos have been a part of our church for a very long time. And, and as Charlie and Kathy go, we want to bless them. Charlie has served faithfully on our trustee board for a long time, has done a lot of what you see around you in the remodel, believe it or not. And uh, his, his, his crafty craftsmanship has really blessed the church. And uh, we, we're thankful for that. Kathy and all the meals that she's helped to create in, in the kitchen and, and doing what she loves to do to, to bless others in hospitality. We're so grateful for them. So we're going to honor them in, in the second service right towards the beginning. But if you see them walking around, please just tell them uh, that you really appreciate them and, and maybe give them a hug as they kind of venture on. This is their home church. This is their home base. But we want to we pray a prayer of blessing over them. So Luke chapter 22 is where we're at. We're in this great series called Famous Last Word. Words, right? The words of Jesus as he hung on the cross. And, and some, these are some of the last words before he departed from the earth. And uh, there, there, there's a saying uh, among men and, and women, especially in the South, some famous last words. And, and uh, please don't get me in trouble for this, okay? But you, you guys know, it's usually at like a, a, a barbecue or, or maybe a bar or a party where there's alcohol. And, and, and these words always seem to be famous last words. And, and that would be, if you ever hear this, hey, hold my... Yeah. So wherever you hear these words, a couple things are going to happen, right? The, the first one is there's going to be furniture probably broken because somebody's going to do something really dumb, maybe broken bones, but also a lot of embarrassment that comes with really famous last words. Um, so if you ever hear those words, just, just run, run away. Don't be around. <laughs> there's probably going to be an ambulance that comes later on. We're, we're looking at some famous last words of Jesus, though. And in Luke 23, we see this. Jesus is actually saying the, the very first words here as we read this, as he hung on the cross. These are the first ones. And, and Jesus had been, he had been beaten, right? He had been humiliated. He had been spit on and punched in the face, beaten with a rod, flogged 39 times with just this evil whip that they created, humiliated to a point where he was unrecognizable to people because of the bodily damage that was done. And not just that, but the, then the emotional damage of, 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 of being, he knew this, even as a man, the creator of all things and letting creation do what they did to him. So he, he marches up this hill and, and, and it called the skull. And, and he there has one criminal on one side and one on the other. And as he's in the middle, he's looking down at all of his accusers. All of his mockers. Looking down on the Roman soldiers just as they had humiliated him and beat him and were ruthless in doing so. Looking down on the scribes and the Pharisees that were mocking him and jealous of him. And he says these words that changed everything. They're on the screen. It's, he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Today, we're going to talk about forgiveness. And we're going to let Jesus' example in this moment help dictate for us what it means to be a forgiving person. Now, I don't know about you, but if it's me, I'm saying, Father, kill them. <laughs> right? Destroy them. Take them out. We need justice. Deal with this situation. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. So as we look at this passage today, it really applies to everybody. Everybody. Because we all have somebody that we need to forgive. I mean, you see, in life we have someone we have an offense with. Maybe you're holding a grudge. Maybe it's with a spouse or just, just an argument that you had and you never really put it, to, put it to bed and put it to rest. Maybe it happened weeks or months ago. It's, you're still harboring. Maybe there's something going on at work and you're holding on to a grudge and you can't let it go. The question for you today is who is it? that you need to forgive today. I, I don't want you to pass on this message because this applies in every single one of us. We need to receive God's forgiveness. But Scripture comes in today and it tells us that we also need to be people who give forgiveness to others. 
See, these were more than just words as Jesus hung on the cross. This was actually a prophecy from over 700 years prior to his coming to the earth. And we can read that from the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53, 12. It says this, that he, and this is Jesus, bore the sin of many and made intercession for their... For the transgressors. You, you guys realize that so far, I mean, this is just one of so, just so many prophecies fulfilled in Christ. Even as he hung on the cross, he was fulfilling prophecy and bringing that in together. What is intercession? Intercession is prayer, right? And so he, these are words of prayer as he's praying them. Father, he says, he's praying to God and he's saying, forgive them, my transgressors, for they know not what they do. You may be praying for someone who is far from God, by the way. In prayer, you, you may be thinking, they'll never come to church. This is hopeless. They're, they're never going to know Him as their Lord and Savior. But never quit. Never give up on praying for those who th you think there is no chance. Because Jesus, even in His last breaths, was a man of prayer. Praying for the forgiveness of those that didn't get what they were doing. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But these words are more than just a prayer. They're more than just a prophecy. They really changed everything when it comes to forgiveness. You see, before Christ, the response was this. This was the before Christ, you owe me and justice is mine, right? That's, that's what they would say. That, that, that you can write that down if you want. That's one of the blanks to fill in. You owe me and, and justice is mine. You see, there was a, a law that said you could have an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. And that was okay. That was law. You, you, could, you could go after that. And the law basically said, if you hurt me, then I'm going to hurt you the same amount. So often today, though, we have the same kind of response, don't we? We, we, we treat these things somewhat the same. It's just not as much law anymore. You get in trouble when you, you, you go after retribution. Someone hurts us, though, and man, we get ticked off. You owe me. Justice is mine. We get mad and we want them to pay. We, we, want, we want them to know that they've done something wrong and how they've hurt us. And we want them to pay for that offense. We want to get even. We are innocent. And we want them to know we didn't do anything. And I'm going to make you pay for that. So we may not do something physically to match what they've done to us. But emotionally or with words, we'll do whatever we can. And that was the pre-Christ response. But what is it after Christ? especially after this moment on the cross. The post-Christ response is, God forgave me, so I'll forgive you. Not as a prerequisite, but he actually gives you the ability to forgive. I'll forgive because God forgave me. He, he's given me the ability to do something countercultural to what we know or even counterintuitive to what we know it, it needs to be done. And Jesus taught this during his ministry on earth to, to his disciples. He's walking down the road with his disciples, teaching them how to pray in Matthew 6, 12. He says, this is how you pray. And in one area of the prayer, he says, pray these words and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. The two are inextricably linked. We can't get away from it. And he, he taught that the forgiveness has to go to a whole nother level in your life. It's not an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. It's, it's I forgive you because God forgave me. He took forgiveness to a whole nother level. Forgiveness can fall into two categories. It can be something we receive, but it also has to be something we give. So today we're going to break down God's word and we're going to look at it. Okay, what, 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 do, we, uh, what do we have to, to, to forgive? Who do we have to forgive? God, who, who are we talking about here? Ask the Holy Spirit. And then how often? Why, why do we need to forgive? And how often? But you, but you don't know, Pastor, what, what they've done to me. I don't want to forgive them. So this is why this is such an important message, because many of you said that in your minds as I was saying what we're going to do today. Because where are we th without forgiveness? I'll give you three words. Separation from God. That's what the scripture tells us. You, as a believer, this is a hard truth, you ready? As a believer, you cannot be a person of unforgiveness. 
you will not receive forgiveness yourself without being someone who can forgive. And, and, and this will begin a separation from God that we would all be doomed to live in for eternity if it weren't for Jesus forgiving us. If, if he didn't do what he did on the cross, but also then give us these words, we would not have a, a, a focal point for, for what forgiveness looks like. And he, he makes the cross, forgiveness central on the cross as he's hanging there uttering these words. He was teaching us about how important it is in our lives that they're not just words. He was setting the stage to tell his disciples and followers, us, today, that forgiveness is where it starts and forgiveness is where it keeps going in your life. It's central. And we are going to look at this message in Matthew 18. And, and it's a really cool text. It's a great piece of scripture. It talks about a servant that was forgiven. Would you guys turn there with me? It's going to be on the screen here for you in the New Living Translation. So turn there in whatever translation you're looking at as you study. But we're going to kind of break it down and talk about, uh, you know, what, what do we have here? Why do I have to forgive? Okay, that's a good question. Because honestly, pastor, they, they don't deserve it. Okay, so we're going to go through it and, and talk about. When I, when I looked at the scripture, I, I, I was studying a bit. And I, I just thought about Peter. Man, one of these disciples, he was willing to say what everyone else was thinking. And, and he was going through his mind about forgiveness. And he really didn't under, understand it, I guess. So he, that, that's the inference I, I feel like I'm making here. And I'm, I'm sure he felt pretty good about himself because he goes right up to Jesus. And he, and he just says, hey, Jesus, how often should you forgive someone? Seven times? Well, he, he's trying to see if the, if the standard was correct, okay? Is that correct? That, that, that's a big deal. I, I could just imagine Peter has probably been through something. Maybe he just got offended by someone. And he's thinking, I've forgiven them, and that's good, right? So how, how many more times would it take? And maybe he brought, I don't know, like maybe he like bought a camel and it had a bum leg, and he had to forgive the guy for it. I, I don't know. Chari I, chari I had a chariot? I don't know. Boat? What, what, whatever it might have been. He, he maybe maybe he, got, he got a bad deal, like we got on our freezer for the food pantry. That's all I'm going to say. But... Uh, Oh, that was that was scandalous, wasn't it? I've forgiven them. You can too, okay? But he kind of feels pretty good right now. And he said to Jesus, how often? And Jesus answers him and says, it's not seven, it's 70 times seven, Peter. So I can just imagine Peter, he, he's like, okay, what is 70 times seven? How, let, me, let me see if I can think about it. So he's trying to work out the numbers in his head. And before he knows it, Jesus just launches into this message on, on forgiveness. And he is, he is out there just, just preaching all of a sudden. And Peter's still going, okay, seven, seven, carry the one, two, for, what, wait, what, what do you? And so he goes on and this is what Jesus says. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servants who had borrowed money from him. Okay, so, by the way, he, he goes on to say right here in this next one, right? In the process of doing this, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. That is a translation of what the, 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 one, the, the versions that you know of in here. It's a, it's a huge debt, okay? It's, it's massive. Some scholars even believe it's in the billions today as we look at money. But verse 25, he couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. Jesus is, is working off of a, a common law in that moment. You could actually be sold or put into prison. You see, in those days, uh, it, it was law, okay? And, and, and until your debt was paid, you, you had to suffer the consequences, either by working as an indentured servant or by going to jail. Now, I, I, I just wonder if that was the law today. Would, would we be so willing to go into debt? Like buying that car or that big screen TV that now is curved instead of just flat because you don't want a flat one anymore. We probably, you know, think twice about buying those pair of shoes or that set of golf clubs or getting that iPhone just because somebody else has it and you want it too. Would we really maybe think twice about going into debt if we realize, oh my, I may have to, uh, to go work at someone's house. Anybody ever, ever, ever either hear of the lesson or have that lesson taught to you where like you, you like, you, you always saw it on TV. Somebody forgot to bring their money or tried to get a meal out of something. All of a sudden, they're back there washing the dishes. But that was, that was you because you bought a TV, okay? 
That's what I'm saying. It says in verse 26, But the man fell down before his master and begged him. I could just sense the emotion in these words that we're about to read together. He's been condemned to slavery with his wife and his kids. And he says, Please be patient with me. I, can, I, can, I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him. And he released him and did what? Forgave his debt. That's a beautiful story. Beautiful story. Someone who's been literally released from this massive debt. So who are these characters in the story? Because this is a parable. So Jesus is taking stuff from what's around him in culture. And then he's applying a truth to it so that we can understand that truth in, in, our, in our context. So this, who's the master and the king? The master, the king, is, is God, right? That's who that is. And who, who, are, who is the servant? Well, he's saying that's you and me, okay? That was, the, that was the, 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 the disciples in front of him or anybody else around them so that they could understand what they're talking about. And there's some lessons that we're going to learn from the forgiven servant. If you're taking notes, write this down. Lesson number one is this. The debtor can't always repay you. I mean, look, look at verse 24 in the process. One of his debtors was brought in who owed millions of dollars. Again, scholars actually say that could be billions in today's currency. And then verse 25 says... Uh, that he couldn't pay it. So often in life, isn't it true that the people who have wronged you can't always repay that debt? And we, have, we all have this debt we can't repay. And I'm not talking about your mortgage. And I'm not talking about those five easy payments that you put down for that egg pod or that box of alien tape online, you know. <laughs> You'll never run out of it. We know you bought the egg pod. It's okay. God, we're praying for you. You'll never use it. But we're talking about actually the sin debt that Jesus paid for us. We all have this debt we can't repay. But there are also things that the debtor can't repay as well. Maybe the debtor in your life is someone who shared something in confidence and they just blurted it out there. They brought people into it before they even knew if they had permission or they, or they threw it out on Facebook somehow and it came back to you. The whole world has seen it. They can't take it off their social in time. It's out there. The word is gone. Maybe you've had this argument with your spouse and you said something and they said something to you and you, they just wounded you or you wounded them. You can't go back. You can't rewind it. That person that's offended you may not be able to repay you in that moment. So the first thing you have to understand is they can't always repay. They can't fix it. They can't rewind the clock. They can't take the words back. It's out there. It's done. It's happened. And let me just take us down a different track. Who, who's ever been relieved of a debt? Any kind, in any way, good or bad. Somebody, you did something horrible and they forgave you in that moment. They fixed it for you. Yeah. Uh, this one is a little, little bit less like that, but we had friends that helped us with a down payment early on in our house buying ventures, and uh, it made it very easy for us. And we were steadily paying them back. It was going to take many years, just like our mortgage payment was going to, but we were going to. But one day they just called us and said, God has blessed us in this financial venture that we're in, and the debt is considered paid off. Thousands upon thousands of dollars for us. And just like that, we didn't know a single sum of money to them anymore. It was an incredible day. But often, the debtor can't always repay. See, here's the second truth that we need to learn from this forgiven servant story. The offended, though, can always show mercy. That's what this tells us. The offended can always show mercy. Verse 27, then the master was filled with pity and he released him and forgave his debt. This is God speaking to us in Jesus' parable to let us know and to remind us that you always, always have the opportunity to have pity and mercy on someone else. We have to show mercy. Another interesting aspect of offenses, okay, is that often the person who offends us, it don't, they don't often know that they even did it. Anybody else been there? Like maybe you've gone back to them eventually and you talk to them about it and that you're sure that they know all about this. And it's going to crush them to know because they've been holding on to this so long themselves and haven't been able to ask for forgiveness. So you've come to them and, and you, you pour out your heart and you say, don't you remember? And they're like, what? 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 
I, I, sometimes this happens, and I'm not saying it's you or anybody in this room, okay? Sometimes I'll walk through the hallways, and I'll be saying hi to people, and, and, and weeks later, I'll find out that on a Sunday, I did not say hi to somebody, and they are very mad at me because of it. You guys have, you have some good reactions this morning, man. I, I, we, this is a scandalous subject, all right? It happens, and I'm like, I, I, they, like a staff will tell me, and I'm like, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I, did, I didn't realize what I had missed, and I, I have to apologize about that. But they're, you know, this person, they say they're just spewing bricks right now. If you don't go talk to them, they're going to be upset. And so they were mad, and they're all twisted, and I didn't know, and I'm sorry. And oftentimes, we don't even know the offense. This plays out in so many areas of our life. Maybe we've got kids and we go to watch our kids play baseball or softball and we're watching that coach like a hawk. Why? Because our kids have not gotten on the field or an at-bat yet. At-bat at bat yet. That's really hard to say. <laughs> and it's like it's, there's only two innings left. And you're, and you're like giving him just the stare, you know, and, and you're, you know you're going to go talk to him. When you get home, you write an email to somebody else that's, a, 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 and they're like, isn't this bad? Oh, yeah, it's bad. And you triangulate all of that. And you're mad at the coach. And you go home, and, and he doesn't even know what he's doing. He's just trying to get all the kids in the game. He has no clue. He doesn't even know how to coach. Somebody just said, please, would you do this? And he was like, okay, yeah. Maybe, ladies, you didn't get invited to that baby shower or, or invited to be in the club where they all wore tutus on the same day. I don't know. I'm not saying that's... that's ever happened in the world that I've watched, but sometimes it does. And, and maybe you didn't get that Christmas card. I don't know what it is. Maybe, maybe you were all twisted and mad about that, and you've, you've picked up an offense, and the person that offended you doesn't even know what they've done. The offended, we have to, as the offended, we, we have to learn the ability to show mercy. I get offended real easy. I mean, really easy when I drive. Okay. I mean, here, here's the thing I don't understand. There's a speed limit, right? Okay, no, no, I, I, I can't. You're supposed to go the speed limit. You're not ever supposed to go under the speed limit, are you? I mean, it's, so the speed limit is 55. You're supposed to go 60. That's my kind of guy right there. I wasn't going to say it, but yeah, you're supposed to go 50, at least 55. I can't stand it when people go slower than the speed limit. I mean, it's ungodly, I think. It's unrighteous. They're breaking laws, going slower. They need to repent, you know. That's how I feel. So I'm driving behind this car one day, right up on their bumper. I mean, really, I didn't. I, I did it. I'm sorry. I got to say it. They're going so slow. They're like 10 miles under the speed limit. I'm, 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 I'm very important, so I was trying to get somewhere. They needed to know that, so I'm like, you know, peering over the side with my car. You know how you do it just to make sure that you can see past them? Just to make sure it's not their fault. Oh, no, it's their fault, so I, now I need them to see me. So you're kind of going over like this, right? And, 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 you're, and you're ready to, to pull beside them, because now you're not just willing to go past them to get where you're going. Now you have to let them know what they've done to you. So you're trying, but the cars are just, they just keep coming down the other lane. You're like, I'm getting passed by everybody in Spring Hill, right? And so you finally get a chance to go to the side. I get to, I get to the side of this person and I'm, I'm getting ready. You know that stare you're going to give them? My wife hates me when I do this. Oh my goodness. She's like, this is so horrible. It's the worst part of you. And I'm like, I know, but I'm working on it. But so I'm there with them and, and I'm ready to look at them and I'm looking over and you wouldn't believe it was Ron DeSantis. I'm totally joking. That didn't happen. <laughs> It was this little old lady, and I, she, was, she was like barely seeing over the, the dashboard. She's 10 and 2, and she's like afraid she's going to wreck. And here I am like staring at her like I can kill her with my eyes, like I'm going to make you feel this. And then I see her, and I'm like, I'm going to hell. Like I'm a horrible person right now. This is terrible what I've just done. And my, my wife, Holly, she reminds me, that was a horrible thing. You know, you have to know. So... We have to learn to go through life showing mercy. We talked about the story of the forgiven servant, but that was only half the story, by the way. There's actually a lot more to, to, to it, and let's look at the rest of the story. And to do that, I, I thought I would show this, this video to you in just a couple minutes. Take a look. So the 
a servant, he's just been forgiven this tremendous debt. We're talking millions of dollars. He's just, I'm free, man, I got no debt. Could you imagine not having a mortgage payment, not having a car payment, everything paid off free and clear. The guy is like, I am a free man, no debt, no worries. And he comes out and he comes across a servant. And this servant owed him $1,000 and he grabs him by the neck and starts choking him, demanding payment. I mean, what is up with that? And the guy couldn't pay, so he had him thrown into prison. about this who had forgiven him that huge tremendous debt and he calls him before him and says you evil servant I forgave you this tremendous debt because you pleaded with me shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just like I had mercy on you and then the angry king he throws him into prison to be tortured until he can pay the entire debt and this is what your heavenly father will do for you. If you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart, why would God be so harsh? Why would he say such a thing? I believe it's because God knows that unforgiveness puts you in a prison. Unforgiveness is like sipping poison, expecting the other person to die. Unforgiveness puts you in a prison. So what about you today? Are, are you in a prison right now? Isn't that true? You sip poison, you expect somebody else to die. It literally chains you up. Have you had unforgiveness in your heart for so long that you've just learned to live with it? I mean, we always think forgiveness is going to benefit the other person. What you've got to understand today is forgiveness benefits you by unlocking the door to that prison and letting you escape and be free. That's really what forgiveness does. It's a, it's a benefit for you that God wants you to understand helps you more than anybody else. And I understand that as we walk and talk about this issue together today, that there are some major, major offenses out there. I do. Huge ones. So what do we do when the offenses so great. What do we do when the offense seems too big? What do we do when we say, Pastor D, you don't know my situation. You don't know what I've gone through. What do we do when the offense is just so great that we just can't even picture even forgiving that person? You say, Pastor D, you don't realize that I had a father and he would come home and when he was drunk, he would beat everybody in our house, including our mom. We would hide in the bedroom. Or pastor, I married someone and they said with me together for better or worse, richer or poor, and it wasn't too long and they had an affair and ran off with someone else. What do I do about that? I can't imagine. Or one of you might say, you don't understand, there was this drunk driver and he hit a family member, injured and killed them. You don't know what I've gone through. I don't, uh, you don't know what I've faced. You don't know how it's affected me. Or, or what about maybe it's a, it's a kid growing up and... As a kid, you were, you were molested by someone that you trusted over and over again. Or you had a coach that said, you're a loser, you'll never amount to anything. You had a teacher who told you you were worthless and dumb. Whatever it is, how do you forgive that person? Let me just say, it's not easy. I'm going to tell you... I'm not going to tell you three steps to forgive them and, and it's done. It doesn't work that way. When I was a young man, someone did something to my family that, sh that that person should have been supporting us and it affected me for years. We didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve it either. That's, that's understandable. As I dealt with that through the years, I said, what do you do with that, Derek? What, how are you going to deal with this? 
And for years, I struggled with it, and it was into my young adult years, in fact. But my relationship with God began to grow, and I started to see how much my heavenly, heavenly Father loved me. And I began to realize what Jesus had done for me on the cross, and it began to make sense in a very real way in how I was dealing with my unforgiveness, that, that He carried every pain and sin imaginable to man, and He hung there. He carried with him all of these abuses and all of these wrongs and all of these evils and all of these lies and all of these things. And he did that because of his love for me and his love for you. That gave me a glimpse into the reality that Jesus' love is greater than any offense. And one of the first places you have to go to when dealing with something that feels too big is to realize this. That no matter what, if you haven't experienced the great love of God, you'll never be able to realize that it is greater than any other offense that could ever be done to you. And as bad as it is, what you've been through, you've got to know that God's love is greater than that offense. And years later, I came across it what felt like for the first time for my soul, even though I'd read it before, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. And it wrecked me as I began to fully deal with this. It says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Whew. I mean, this whole time that I've been wanting something to happen to this other person, or at least for them to recognize what they did and apologize for it. You mean, I, I've been the one who's become in the wrong. I, I'm the one who's holding on to this, and I can't even forgive them. And God, if I don't, you're telling me, yeah, son, it separates you from me. It takes you out of out of my grace when you don't operate the way I've asked you to operate, the way I operate with you. And as hard as it is, we have to recognize that forgiveness at that point becomes a choice. So often in life, we want to try to forget, we want to try to manage, we want to try to push that offense as far away from us as we can. And we, and we create in us this, this person that, that offended us, and they get worse and worse as time goes on, and the, 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 it all becomes worse. And as I was studying for this sermon, I want to share with you before we go to the Lord in prayer and finish today, I want to read you something that can and will give you perspective on that love of Jesus that is greater than any offense. And it came, and of all things, I don't really subscribe to this, but this I, I just saw it on Facebook. Thank you, Jesus. A warrior Women post. It says, yet in that room, hours before the death of Jesus, Judas ate too. Oh, that's an interesting thing. Let me think. Let me read this. Jesus fed Judas too. Jesus prayed for Judas too. Jesus washed Judas's feet too. I struggle to fathom what kind of love, that kind of love, the, a love that would feed the mouth that deceived you. A love that would wash the treasonous feet of the traitor. A love that could forgive even the vilest of betrayals. I honestly struggle, they go on to say, to comprehend it. And then, suddenly, I realize that I'm Judas. Okay? And in that moment... I'm so thankful and altogether overwhelmed that Judas ate too. So listen, you don't, you don't want to separate yourself from the grace and forgiveness of your Lord Jesus Christ. And the separation from the Father, that would be too huge of a thing because that's what Jesus did for us all. He forgave even the vilest of betrayals from you and from me so that we could eat with Him too. And He did it knowingly, knowing that it would happen. So here's my challenge to you today. In this idea of can I forgive and who is it that I need to forgive? I want us to remember so we can make a step towards forgiveness today. Because when Jesus hung on the cross, he prayed that prayer and that step that we all need to take towards forgiving that person starts with prayer. Okay? 
I don't expect you to forgive them today or tomorrow necessarily, but I, I, I do want to challenge you today to take a step towards prayer. And prayer is just that time with the Lord where you honestly bring this to Him. And here's what prayer does for you, okay? It invites Christ, the King of the universe, who showed us how to forgive into your heart to do something you can't do. That's what, it's what you're going to do. That's what prayer is in this moment. When you can't fathom that, that you could ever forgive that person, you simply take this step right now. God, I invite you in right now to that place. And I recognize that your, your, your supremacy, your sovereignty, it, 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 it can be Lord of this moment too. And I recognize you can do what I can't do. What is impossible for me is possible for you in this moment. You can come in and you can turn my heart around, God. You can forgive and you can, you can let go and you can be free from that prison. That's what taking the step into prayer is about. So if you would bow your heads with me today, I just want to say to you, He did it for me and He wants to do it for you. He wants to set you free from the prison of unforgiveness. It starts with a choice that you choose to take steps forward towards forgiveness through prayer. God can do something we can't, but Pastor D, it's impossible. I can never forgive that person. Let me tell you again, what's impossible for man is possible for God. And he can do more than you could ever imagine. As we make that step towards him through prayer, God can change your life by his love and grace. He doesn't always change the other person, but prayer always changes you. That is our step today. So if you're that person and for unforgiveness has held you in a prison, you're the one suffering and God wants to set you free. So if that's you today, I want to pray for you. I want to invite you into this moment as, these, as they sing. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer over your life. But I just need to know that's you. If it's you and, and you're online, write it in the comments for us to see. If it's you in person, just simply raise your hand. We do this all the time. I want you to raise your hand. And just know that as we sing this song, you can come to the altar and bring that prayer even closer to Him in a symbol of, of, of surrender by kneeling before him. But if you would just raise your hand, if there's unforgiveness in your heart and you're like, this is me, I need to take this step in prayer. I wanna pray for you. But before I, before I go, amen, I see these hands. Before we go there, I want you to do this if you already aren't. I want you to picture that person, not to make yourself upset or to, to wallow in self-pity. I, I want you to picture someone that you know has offended you or, or maybe the Lord's revealing to you right now that you've offended and we want to pray for that person we want to choose to forgive today by coming to God in prayer we pray God that you would do something in our hearts that we are unable to do that you would let forgiveness come over us that we would be able to forgive that we'd be able to let go that we'd be able to move on Release these people in Jesus' name from that debt, Lord. Allow us to release that person from this debt they can't repay. Father, we forgive them in Jesus' name. As we believe and agree on that, would we just sing this song together before we close?